Hey everyone, so it's Hearth and welcome back to my channel. On today's video, we're going to be talking about how you can expand your magical practice without just reading yet another witchcraft book. Magical practice is a very personal thing. Everyone is going to have a different style, a different technique based on their own tradition, their culture, their background, as well as what they find works well for them. But the one thing that can be really easy to do is to get stuck in a rut. I've experienced this myself, where I do the same style of working time and time again, because it works and I know it works, so what's the point in changing something if it works? But if you continuously do the same style of working on repeat for years, even decades, you can often find yourself feeling very stagnant in your magical practice. You can almost get bored because you're doing the same thing, just in a slightly different way for different workings. So today we're gonna to be talking about how you can advance your practice, expand it to include other things, without having to read another book. Now don't get me wrong, I love books, and if someone asks me how they can expand their magical practice, usually I recommend reading. I usually recommend finding a book on a topic you've never learned anything about before and giving it a go. If you don't like it, then oh well. If you do like it, then that could be something new that you could do. But not everyone finds reading easy or accessible. There are many reasons why reading might not be the best option for you, whether that is because you really struggle with reading or you struggle with eyesight or mobility. There's lots of things that can inhibit people from actively reading. So I wanted to talk about five ways that you can expand your magical practice and almost force yourself to expand your magical practice and try new things that don't require you to pick up or purchase a book because it's not something that everyone has access to. The first technique I like to use involves changing the style of practice. So rather than changing the intention of a working, instead you decide to change how you're going to do it. Now this can be quite experimental, especially if you aren't well versed on different forms of magical practice. So I wouldn't recommend doing this on anything large. I'd recommend a small, simple working. And it might take a little bit of research, talking to people, learning from YouTube videos, reading if you really want to, but it isn't a requirement. This technique is all about choosing something to switch up. So if you want to do a cleansing working with the fire element, instead do a cleansing working with the water element. You aren't changing your intention, you aren't changing the goal of that working, you're just gonna be changing up how you're doing it. And by doing such a dramatic mix up, it can really make us focus on the specific aspects of that working. Why are we doing it? How can I do it that's different than how I would normally do it? And I often find, especially with things like the elements, we can definitely get into a rut of which ones we like working with and which ones we don't like working with. And ultimately it constricts our magical practice, it limits us. So if you only work with the air element, try working with the water element. If you only work with the earth element, try working with the fire element. Mix it up because often these elements can be used in many different ways. You can use fire to cleanse, just as you can use water to cleanse, and air to cleanse, and earth to cleanse. It's about trial and erroring your way through to figure out the different techniques that you can use for the same intention, just with a different elemental body. Now this doesn't have to be done with just the elements. This can be done with anything. If you find that you like using one style of candle magic, try doing it the other way. Try working with the element of fire instead of the candle as a vessel. If you usually work higher magic, try working lower magic and see how it feels to you. Now this can be quite daunting, which is why I don't recommend doing this for any massive ritual, but just for small, simple workings, the worst that can happen is that you don't get a successful result but at least you try doing that working in a slightly different way. And by trying it, it opens up our horizons to new possibilities. Now, although the things I've recommended might seem really extreme, you don't have to make it quite that extreme. You can just change up something small. If in a working, you would usually work with one plant, try working with a slightly different plant that might have similar associations. If you usually work with a particular stone or a particular colour, try changing it up for that working and see how things change. This is especially useful if you do the same working regularly. 
Take that traditional working that you usually use and change something in it. And when you change something in that working, pay attention to how it changes the energy, how it changes the feeling within that space, and also how it changes the magical response. And by doing this, it allows you to deeper develop your practice and to have a better understanding of why you're using the things you're using. This can be exceptionally useful if you are just getting the hang of correspondences, whether they be planetary, astrological, colour, fragrance, plant, whatever it might be. These correspondences aren't just plucked from thin air. They're taken from years of trial and error to figure out what works and what doesn't. It's very easy for us to go on the internet and just search for a correspondence list, but it's something different to actually figure out the correspondences for yourself through years of trial and error. Now, this doesn't mean you have to figure out how every plant works based on trial and error, but it's worth doing it at least once within your magical practice. Take a working that you know is normally successful, you know how it normally feels, and then change something significant. It doesn't have to be a change for the worse, it can just be a substitution, and then figure out how that changes the energy and the feel of that working. Does it amplify the outcome or minimize it? Does it stop the working completely or does it cause it to go somewhere else? write everything down, document it, and then you can really add this further into your magical practice if you find that it's really useful. This technique is something that I love doing, and although it can seem really intimidating to start off with, by switching out elements or the type of magic that you're doing or the items that you're using, it can definitely allow you to broaden your horizons. The second technique is to undertake no tool divination. Now in the 21st century, I have found that most divination readers will rely on specific tools to help them with their readings. They will rely on tarot and oracle cards, runes, oem, pendulums, whatever it might be. They often use these magical tools as an aid, but ultimately they can become a crutch. They can very much limit your divinatory practice because you're always relying on the object more than yourself. Now, when it comes to divination, you are tapping into psychic energies. Now, this might be your own psychic energies, but you also might be tapping into the spirits that are around you if you have requested their assistance in this divination session. And a lot of people feel that it's the tarot cards that are coming up with the answers for them, or it's the pendulum that's coming up with the answers. But in reality, these items are simply tools. You are working through them. They are a physical representation of the answer that you are coming up with. This is why when you shuffle tarot cards, you often shuffle until it tells you to stop. Now, a lot of people think that the it is the tarot cards, but it isn't always the case. What's usually happening is that your psychic subconscious is telling you, stop here. These are the cards that you're going to want to work with in order to represent the imagery and the answers that you already have. Have. When it comes to these magical tools, they can be a great aid, especially if you're just getting started, and they can be really good if you enjoy working with them. Just don't allow yourself to be limited by them. Your psychic abilities don't require tarot cards or runes in order to manifest. You can undertake psychic divination without needing any of these tools. It just requires you to train certain abilities. So try out a different form of divination that doesn't require these magical tools in the same way whether that is scrying or dream interpretation, these things can really help strengthen your psychic abilities without you having to buy expensive magical tools. Scrying can be done in so many ways, and sometimes these may require magical tools and sometimes they might not. Some of the most famous versions of scrying involve using a crystal ball. This could be made of actual crystal or being made of high quality glass, which is referred to as crystal due to its lead content. It gives it this strange sparkly characteristic that is really good for divination. Now, scrying doesn't have to cost you anything. You can scry with a black mirror, an obsidian mirror, or you can scry with a dark bowl of water or a candle flame. Now, I'm hoping in the future to do a whole video on scrying because it really is a technique in and of itself. But things like black mirrors and scrying bowls can be really easy to make. For water scrying, you can use a cauldron or you can use a black bowl or a dark coloured bowl. For mirror scrying, you can take a picture frame that has a glass sheet and you take the glass sheet out, you paint the back of it black with acrylic paint, you allow it to dry, you put it back in the frame and ta-da, you have your own black scrying mirror. And these techniques for scrying are exceptionally useful and they can really help develop your underlying psychic abilities. The main goal here is to enter into a trance-like state. 
Usually you will sit quietly in a dimly lit room, commonly it's only lit with candles, and you allow yourself to zone out on the object that you are scrying into, whether that is a crystal ball, whether that is a fishing float, or a black mirror, or a scrying bowl, and you allow yourself to zone out, your eyes will relax, and then from this relaxed trance-like state, you can draw out images, colours, sights, smells, sounds that you can then interpret as you would tarot cards to gain a magical psychic understanding of a question. Now you don't have to just use scrying, something like tassiomancy is also really useful. This is tea leaf reading and I'm actually hoping to do a video on tea leaf reading in next week's episode. Now beyond this you can also undertake dream journaling and dream interpretation. Our dreams are a way of tapping into our subconscious mind. It's our subconscious mind telling us things. Now, for many people, you might not remember your dreams. So writing in a dream journal can be really useful. Every morning when you wake up before you do anything else, you write anything that you can remember from your dream inside the dream journal. Over time, your brain starts to acknowledge that you want to remember your dreams, and so it's much easier to recall them. If you already know your dreams, then write down the things that you remember that are of significance. Was there a particular person, a particular plant, an animal, a smell, a sight, a sound? And then sit quietly and really contemplate on how these things might be interpreted in your life. How do you feel? about the things that are shown to you. Now, I know that a lot of people use dream dictionaries. I personally don't recommend it, mainly because your dreams are entirely personal. How you feel about an animal is gonna be different to how I feel about it based on your own experiences, your own memories. For me, if I were to see a shark in a dream, this isn't something to be scared of because sharks have always been a very positive thing in my life. But if I were to see a goose in my dream, very different matter. Geese scare the living daylights out of me. And that's what makes me different from you. Maybe if you saw a shark in your dream, it would be a really bad thing, but maybe you really like geese. And that's why it's really important with dream interpretation to not rely on dream dictionaries and instead to look inward to figure out what that symbolism might mean for you, because it's gonna be very different to how it might be for me. Now, these are things that you can all do that are divination without needing tools in many cases. And it might not be a quick process, it's going to take time. So if you don't get scrying on the first try, believe me, that's normal. Scrying is a really tricky thing to get down unless you're really good at it, because it's something that you aren't used to doing, especially if you're used to relying on magical tools. So give yourself time. You don't have to cut off using your magical tools or your divinatory tools. Do this alongside it, and hopefully you'll find that you will develop your practice further, and you might find then that you don't necessarily need to use the tools or want to use the tools in quite the same way as you were before. The third technique is to set yourself a challenge. Now, I am not a particularly competitive person, but I find that a challenge really pushes me to do things that I wouldn't normally do. And that's really what we're gonna be talking about in this. This isn't a competition. This isn't forcing yourself to do something that you don't want to do. This is just giving yourself an incentive. Try a 30 day challenge where you're pushing yourself to do something every day for 30 days. It doesn't have to take you hours. It can just be a few minutes out of your day because repetition really helps improve us. Now, I think a lot of people get disheartened when they try something new in witchcraft and it doesn't manifest instantly, so they revert back to what they were doing before because what they were doing before works for them. But the reality is, is that nothing is instantaneous. No one ever gets good at something the first time they do it, unless you are one of those golden people who is just successful at everything. I am jealous of you if that is the case, <laughs> but most people are not like that. Most people require practice and repetition, as well as a lot of failure to be able to get good at something. And that's where these 30 day challenges really push you. Now these challenges can be really big. It can require you to undertake a large expansive working every day for 30 days. But the reality is most people can't afford to do that. We don't have the time to do that. We don't have the energy to do that. So you can instead just do something small. Every morning when you wake up, meditate for two minutes. Or every morning when you wake up, write in your dream journal and document everything that you can remember from your dream. Before you go to bed at night, you might want to do some meditative or some deep breathing to really help calm you down. You might want to do a divination reading every single day, trying out the same technique time and time and time again. Or you might want to start adding tea magic into your daily routine and start making a tea that matches your intention. You might want to take a walk outside and connect with a tree every day for 30 days to help build a deeper connection to the tree spirit. These are all things that don't have to take a huge amount of time, but can really develop your magical practice. 
I often find that unless I give myself a reason to do something, I don't do it. And that's just the way I've always been. I am that person who works to the deadline. If I'm given a deadline in two months, I will push it for two months before I do it. And that's just what I'm like as a person. So I find that these challenges are really useful for me because it pushes me to do it every single day. I don't have the chance to put it off because I have to do it on a daily basis. And this allows us to also start making routines. Typically routines take several weeks to kick in and often practice takes several weeks to kick in too. You might find that if you're starting a new divination technique and you're doing it every single day for a month, you might find that for the first two weeks you're terrible at it, but that doesn't mean that you should stop. That means you need to keep going for a little bit longer to see if you can start getting good at it. And these challenges can be a great way to force yourself to do it so that you can better your magical practice. And I would recommend also keeping a diary or some kind of track of how you're feeling on a daily basis. Note down how successful it was. Did you enjoy doing it? Did you find it difficult? What kind of things did you pick up on? Did you sense anything new? Now, obviously what you write down is gonna vary. If you're connecting with a tree spirit, the things you write down are gonna be very different than if you're doing, I don't know, a dream journal. But take a note of how you're feeling on a daily basis because progress is usually slow and it's often very subtle. And you might not think that over that 30 days you are making progress, but if you actually look back at the diary, you might find that you have made so much progress that you didn't realize because it was so subtle and so slow. So I love these 30 day challenges. I know it sounds a little bit like a YouTube trend, but they don't have to be. It's simply a way of pushing yourself to do something new. For me, I found that going outside every day for 30 days really helped me connect to my sense of place. And so that was one challenge that I did several years ago that has completely changed my magical practice. Now the fourth technique is to attend a show, whether that is online or in person. Now MBS shows, witchcraft shows, occult shows happen all over the world. Now obviously some countries are gonna have more shows than others. In the UK, we have MBS shows coming out of our ears and same in America, I believe. But if you live in other places, you might not be so lucky as to have an in-person show. But if you do have the chance to go to an MBS show or an occult show, a witchcraft show, they can be revolutionary to your practice because it allows you to learn topics without having to read a book. Oftentimes these shows will have lots of stalls that you can talk and interact with. I absolutely love getting to talk to people when they come to the stall and chat with me about the products and the practice. I just, I just love it and I know that lots of other stall holders love it as well. Alongside stall holders, they usually have both talks and workshops going on throughout the day that are usually undertaken by people who are exceptionally knowledgeable in that particular field. So instead of relying on reading books on topics, at the shows you can listen to a 30 to 45 minute talk by someone who is exceptionally knowledgeable on the topic and come away with so much information. You can then ask them questions, ask them to point you in the right direction to other books or the media that you can use to learn about it. And ultimately you might be able to come away with more information in 45 minutes than you would have learned in two weeks reading a book. And so I think it's really good to have that balance. I always like reading books, but not everyone is gonna find it as easy and these MBS shows can be incredibly useful. Now, not only can you go to talks at these MBS shows, but you also often have workshops. So if you've always wanted to try some guided meditations, if you really wanted to try some journeying, or if you really want to learn how to make a magical item, you'll often find that these MBS and witchcraft shows will actually have workshops. So at some of these shows, you can sign up for a workshop and you can have, in some cases, one-on-one -on -one interaction with someone who is so knowledgeable on their subject and you can learn so much about it and even give it a go with other people who are also interested. Some of my favorite experiences attending MBS shows have been going to workshops. They can be as simple as a group guided meditation or a journeying, or they can be really detailed looking into pendulum divination, even energy work you can have a workshop on. And they're a really good way of getting hands-on techniques, hands-on understanding of a practice that's guided by someone who's incredibly knowledgeable so that you can then further your research with a really good foundation of basic practice. And so these workshops are really, really useful to go to. But if you don't have any in-person MBS shows, do not fret. There are lots of online events that are exceptionally good. Every few weeks, I attend an online seminar all about witchcraft or a surrounding topic. These are available mostly by Zoom, and there are a few different options out there. You can find them on Eventbrite and probably a few other ticket sellers online. 
They're usually pretty affordable. You can often book the tickets up to a day before the event, maybe even a few hours before the event. And then you sit in your home, nice and warm, in your pajamas, wrapped up with a hot chocolate, and you can learn some amazing stuff from some fantastic people. And I've been doing these shows for the last maybe year, and I have learned so much good stuff. I've got loads of book recommendations from these people. It's really helped to expand my practice. And that's something that is particularly good if you are not in a location that has lots of in-person shows. You can definitely attend some of these online ones because it typically doesn't matter where you are in the world as long as you have internet connection and you can connect to Zoom. And the last technique is probably my favourite, reconnecting with the landscape. Now I found that in the modern world, many people are very disconnected from their sense of place. And that's because we don't really need to be anymore. When you can read a witchcraft book that was written by someone half a world away and incorporate it into your magical tradition, you don't really need to connect with the landscape the same way you did 20, 30 years ago. Even when I was starting to practice, the majority of people that I knew didn't read witchcraft books. They went off their own instinct, their own tradition, and they also connected deeply with the land. Now, people don't need to do that so much. We have access to tens of thousands of witchcraft books from everywhere around the world at our fingertips, and at any given moment, we can learn something new from somewhere else. And authors wanting to sell books will often not connect their book or their work to the land because they want you to be able to do it even if you live thousands of miles away. This can lead to a real disconnect between us and our landscape. And it also limits the magical practice that people feel as though they can do. Now, connecting with the landscape doesn't mean that you have to pack up shop, move into a cabin in the woods and never speak to anyone ever again. Although, I gotta admit, sometimes it's kind of tempting. <laughs> Reconnecting with the landscape is more about your intention. It's about the willingness to spend time out in nature, reconnecting with everything that that encompasses, including plants, as well as animals and the spirits that you might encounter. You don't need to spend hours a day out in the middle of the wilderness. Instead, just spend 10, 15 minutes walking through a local park, sitting on a balcony or going out into a woodland, going to your local beach, whatever it is that you have around you that's accessible to you. And that's one of the really important things here. It's not about pushing yourself really hard and getting into a super remote place. It's just about interacting with the natural environment that is around you. And if you live in a busy city and all you have is a tiny little park that is full of children playing or that's full of dog shit, then that is going to have to do because not everyone has access to the middle of the Canadian wilderness. You know what I mean? Now, I typically find that I like to incorporate a challenge into this. So I will go out every day for 30 days and I will try to connect with my landscape sit around the trees, spend time interacting with the trees, walk around, document the nature that you can see. If you don't know the plants and animals that reside within your area, it could be worth looking up ways to identify them, whether that is using a book, whether that is using an app, something that helps you to connect with the plants and animals that are in your local area. Now, typically I recommend going out only when it's safe to do so. If that means that you have to go with other people, then go with other people. It's not gonna limit what you're able to do as long as you're willing to explain it or excuse excuse your kind of odd behavior, perhaps. It's much better to be safer than to be sorry. Uh. So don't put yourself in any danger while doing this. Go out during the day. If you need to go out with people, go out with people. I wouldn't recommend wearing headphones for two reasons. One, it's quite dangerous, but also it stops you from connecting with the natural world. When you go outside into nature, you really want to be present. And this is where the idea of being present really comes in. If you're going to want to connect with the natural landscape, you cannot be distracting yourself with a computer, with your phone, with TikTok, with music. You cannot be distracting yourself. You need to be actively present in that space. Otherwise, everything around you is gonna pass you by. And it tells all of the spirits out there that you don't want to interact with them. You can sit in front of a tree every day for a year, but if you are scrolling through Instagram with music blasting in your ears, with your sunglasses on, you are not going to be present. And so nothing else is gonna to want to interact with you either. Now, while you're out there, you might want to do several things. You might want to undertake some meditation. You might want to be paying attention to the energy of the plants around you. You might want to be identifying the plants around you. But the one thing I recommend more than anything else is just sitting. Just be present within that place. Sit quietly, sit contently, bring a blanket if you need to, bring a jacket, bring some tea, whatever it is that you need, and just sit and watch. 
Watch how the trees move, watch how the plants rustle, watch any animals that might come out to investigate who you are. Watch the insects and the butterflies, watch anything around you. And the more time you spend watching, you might start to notice other things as well. You might begin to notice the energy of the plants around you. You might start to hear the whisperings of trees or the wind. You might start to see spirits appearing around you. No matter where you are, it's quite likely that there are going to be nature spirits or other spirits around you. And the more time you spend being present, the more acclimatised they're going to be to you being there and the more likely they will be to interact with you. It's the equivalent of getting an animal to like you. You can't just run up to a cat and expect that they aren't going to run away. They're going to be scared of you. They don't know who you are. They don't know your intentions. They're probably going to run away. But if you spend time slowly getting the cat accustomed to you, they're going to be more willing to interact with you and spend time with you freely. The same applies to spirits. You can't just run up to them and want them to interact with you. That's not how it's going to work. You're going to need to spend time getting them acclimatised to your presence. You might want to take a notebook to document the things that you're seeing, the things that you're feeling, the images that might come through to you. These can all help develop psychic connections as well as just to help you remember the things that you've experienced. And over time, you might find that the natural spirits around you, whether they be nature spirits, shades, they might be people who have passed over, they might be fairies, will want to interact with you. And you might choose, if it's safe to do so, to connect with them, either within workings, or you might choose for them to become your familial spirit. But as always here, it's important to remember that spirits don't always have your best intentions at heart, so just be cautious, especially if you are wanting to work with a spirit for the first time. Make sure you are very safe while doing so, make sure you have your protections up, yada, 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 you know what I mean. But you might come away with this having a plethora of nature spirits that you can choose to work with. You might find that you have plant spirits that you can choose to work with. So if you've identified the plants in your local area, you might find that you want to work with them in your spell work and rituals, whether that is for their magical properties or for the spirit that is attached to them. Especially with trees, I have found that the more time you spend with them, the more deeply connected you will become to them. And this is how I started working with Oum. I spent a lot of time in the woods. And by doing so, I really connected with many of the trees and I wanted to work with the tree spirits within my divination. And so I started working with Oum. Ultimately, you might find that working with the landscape and the things within it just aren't for you. But at least you manage to have some time contemplating it, doing some meditation on it, being out in nature, because regardless of whether you choose to work with it further, it's just really good to be out in nature and to feel nature all around you. And you might come away feeling something different is for you. Maybe you spent time around a stream and rather than working with the plants and the spirits, you found that the water is what you want to work with. Or maybe you really connected with the air element and that's what you want to work with. You might come away from this with a completely different perspective or you might have found just one new thing that you want to connect with. But either way, connecting to the landscape is exceptionally useful. It allows us, especially if we live in the area where our ancestors lived, it allows us to connect with them as well as connecting to our sense of space and place and time, which can all be exceptionally useful in developing your magical practice. So I know that this was a pretty long video, especially for one that I came up with late last night, I think it was about 2am, but I hope that you did find this useful. These are all techniques that I have used myself and I have found them to be incredibly useful, especially the challenge. I have found that setting myself a 30 day challenge for anything makes me far more willing to push past that feeling of I can't do it and more willing to give myself a chance because ultimately that's what we all need. We just need a chance to be able to succeed at something. And that can be really tricky, especially if we like succeeding and don't like failing. You often find that you stop doing what you're doing if it doesn't work instantly. And that is very counterintuitive, especially when it comes to witchcraft. So I found that you can incorporate the challenge aspect into basically anything in this list, whether that is going regularly to MBS shows, making an effort to go to online events, whether that is making sure that you scry every single day for a month, you can mix and match things. And hopefully, I really hope that this helps to expand some of your magical practices beyond just reading books. Let me know what your favourite techniques are for expanding your magical practice that don't require books. I would absolutely love to know. If you did enjoy this video, feel free to give it a like. It really means so much to me. If you do have any questions, comments, concerns, video ideas, or just want to chit chat with the community, feel free to put it down in the comment section. And if you do enjoy the magical content on this channel or in this video, feel free to hit subscribe. I try to post magical content every single week. And with that being said, I hope you have a marvellous magical day and I will see you in the next video. 
So today's video was meant to be very different than it actually is. I have actually been editing a reaction video for about the last two weeks. And over the past few days, I've been really trying hard to get it done for this week. And then I had this epiphany last night. I thought to myself, hang on, is this gonna get copyright claimed? And I just had this gut feeling. So I exported the 15 minutes that I'd done, which by the way, is only a fraction of the editing that I've been doing over the last two weeks. And I imported it into YouTube and within 0.2 seconds, I got a copyright claim. So that video idea went straight out the window. That is 60 hours of my life that I will never ever get back. <laughs> so I'm having to really quickly film another video today. My voice is pretty much shot. I don't know why. I think it's the change in the weather. My voice is so messed up. So if I sound a little bit like I'm chain smoking, it's because my voice is just really, really messed up today. Oh, I have gone blindingly white again. I mean, I'm pale, but I'm not quite glowing. I mean, I am kind of glowing the dark pale, but I'm not like luminous. I am not a torch. Okay. Also, the merch is finally finished. I've been talking about having merch for about two and a half years. It's finally done. I was meant to be releasing it in October, but that just never happened. I got really, really busy and it wasn't finished, but I finally got the last sample piece and I am so, so happy with it. So I will show you some of that. And uh, yeah, I'm so excited. It is available down in the description box. There is a link to it. I think I'm actually gonna lose my voice before I get to the end of this video. I was hoping to film an entire other video today. I don't think, I don't think that's gonna happen. I just, I just don't think that's possible. Mm -hmm. 